Okay, we're going to start in about three seconds live. Shh. Very good evening and uh, very well welcome once again to the Southern Conference uh, CAM meeting. Uh, and it is just so beautiful that, uh, well, we have a almost full room here and uh, we would like to welcome those who are joining us online. I have an uh, apology for this 15 minutes delay as we, uh, we could have a additional, I would say, bonus for sure. We have a guest which is joining us today, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. So we want to make sure that the sound you have and the, you know, everything that takes place here is to the best. So a very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, in case you are somebody who is in this room or, or, or online, we would like to ask you for a moment, if that's all right, please do share the link uh, uh, with your friends. So if you're able, just for a moment, take your phone, uh, go to the YouTube channel, South England Conference, and there is a button uh, where there is a, you will see the live program. Press and share and uh, invite your friends to be here with us tonight. And so that is the one small thing you can do, but they can actually change somebody's life. So please do take a moment and uh, we would uh, greatly appreciate that. So my friends, uh, as the program uh, is going to pretty much go unannounced from this point. I just want to ask for a few moments, if that's all right, we're going to just have a word of prayer as a family here and online, and uh, we just want to encourage everybody uh, who has a prayer request to also come to this wall and write their prayer requests. And we're going to pray until the end of the camp meeting, and then we're going to keep praying for those prayer requests as well for those who are leaving them online. So thank you so much, as this is one way we can truly feel as a family. So let's bow our heads and let us pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you so much for another day in our lives. Thank you for another opportunity that we can make a decision to follow you. And we want to ask, dear God, forgive our sins and bless us. Keep us close to you, dear God, and fill us with this wish and this compassion to go outside of our comfort zones and make a difference in the lives of those who need, those who need help. At the same time, we want to pray, dear God, and uh, for our families, for our churches, wherever they are. We sometimes have the, these good seasons and some tough seasons. And maybe this is one of the seasons which we need you in our communities as well. So dear God, come through. Touch our hearts and minds and bless us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Just as we continue, I just want to remind you that uh, at the Stamper Press, you have a, uh, we have focus magazines which are actually paid for by the South England Conference. Tomorrow is Sabbath. I'm not saying you should do evangelism on Sabbath only. I'm saying you should always be there for your friends and communities. But if you would like to do something more tomorrow, you would like to get off the campsite and share some of those magazines, please do come to the tent. Uh, they will have, have them free for you there. So make sure you grab them. So now let's start with worship. God bless you all, and thank you so much all for joining. Good evening, everyone. No, no, no. <laughs> this is the most people we've had, and that's the quietest good evening I've received. Good evening, everyone. Fantastic. Happy Friday, and it's honestly, again, as I say every day, a privilege to be able to lead you guys in worship and sing with you. Um, we're going to sing a song that we've been learning for the whole week. All right, this is a song that we're very familiar with, every word, every note we must know by now. So please where we stand as we sing our theme song as we start our praise and worship with the theme song. Please where we stand. Create in me a clean heart so that I may worship thee. Let's sing together. Say, create in me. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart. I'm I'm purified. You know this song very well. Purified. Create in me. Create in me a peace. So I may worship thee. So I Isn't that again? may worship thee. I want to hear everyone say, Create in me a clean heart. Create in me. Give me some parts of purified. I'm purified. Chorus. 
sing with us now. Cast me not, cast me not away from thy presence. Please don't take, please don't take your spirit. Just restore the joy. And restore the joy of salvation. So that I may cast me not. Cast me not. Cast me not. Sit with us. Say, please don't take. Just restore the joy and restore. So that, so that I, 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 let's worship the Lord together. So that I, last time, so that I. So that I may worship me. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Now, this praise and worship contains some of my, well, one of my favorite hymns, and definitely one of my favorite songs. The, the theme for today, I tried to choose the songs in line with the, the theme that Pastor Ty is preaching. And this one today is called Weakness to Power. Weakness to Power. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 says, But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Who thinks that God's grace is marvelous? It's a marvelous grace. We're going to sing hymn number 109, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. Hymn number 109. Give me that introduction again. Let's sing together, hit number one and nine. Beautiful song. To marvelous grace, to marvelous, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Say grace, grace that exceeds our sin. Speed up a bit. Yonder, yonder on Calvary. Beautiful. There where the blood. There where the blood. Just the chorus. Give us a part. Say grace, 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 grace. God's grace. God's grace. Grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace. 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 God's grace. God's grace. I want to hear you guys in the second verse. That is greater than all our sin. sin and despair. Sin. Sin and despair like the sea. Threaten the soul. Threaten the soul. Yeah. So grace, it is greater, yes, grace. And it points to the refuge. Say points. Let's go to the chorus. Say grace, say grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Say grace that will pardon. Grace that will pardon and cleanse. Say grace, grace. Freely bestowed, freely bestowed on all who say you that are longing. Let's go to the chorus now. Give me grace, grace. Say grace, grace. Say grace, grace. God's grace. God's grace. Grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse. Say grace, grace. Amazing. God's grace. And it will pardon and grace cleanse. Will pardon and cleanse. Who believes that God's grace is greater than all our sins? I want to hear the chorus. Can we cut the music, please? God's grace. Cut the music. 
Give me the chorus now. Say grace, grace. Sing with us. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that will part. Can I get a snap, please? Grace, grace. Pardon. Grace that will pardon and grace yeah. Grace, 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 grace that is greater. God's grace. Grace, grace that is greater. Say grace that is greater. Grace, grace that is greater. Grace that is greater than Grace that is greater. Grace that is greater Grace, grace, marvelous grace. We're going to sing one more song for you. It's called Hallelujah, Salvation and Glory, Honor and Power unto the Lord our God. This song requires three parts, soprano, alto, and tenor. So please listen to our praise team. Sing along with us. Hallelujah, Salvation and Glory. It's a beautiful song. You don't know it's very simple. Say hallelujah. We're gonna sing it for you. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation. Salvation and glory. Very simple. Honor and power. Honor and power unto the Lord. Our Say for the Lord our God is mighty. For the Lord our God. For the Lord our God. Is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. Yeah. Yes, the Lord. The Lord our we go to the next part. God, he is the next part says, All praises be. All oh, praises. All oh, praises be to the Lord. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God is wonderful. He is one. Say that one more time. Say all oh, praises. Soprano, if you're a soprano. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yeah, say he is wonderful. He Can I hear them sing? Can, Can I hear the soprano sing? Say holla, say holla. Beautiful, gorgeous. Hallelujah, yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Alto is joining now. If you're an alto, listen very carefully. It's all praises. All praises. Yeah. If you're an alto, follow the lovely altos. Our God. He is wonderful. You got the altos? Let's bring it back down. It's all praises. All praises. Following it? Lord of Lords. And the Lord tennis. Lord and we've got some tennis here. Let's put the tennis part very carefully. Hallelujah. Salvation.
salvation. Salvation and glory. Say honor and power. Let's take it Say he is wonderful. He is wonderful. Oh, praise Say salvation and glory. Thank you. Sing with us. Salvation and glory. Say honor and power. Honor and power. Last time, last time. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. Hallelujah, say hallelujah, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say salvation. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 Let's worship God tonight. Yeah, hallelujah. Last time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation. Hallelujah. 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 He is wonderful. He is wonderful. Wonderful, he is wonderful. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Do you know, I love that song because it reminds me that our God is in control no matter what the circumstances. He is wonderful. He doesn't change. He doesn't change. He's our salvation and, and he deserves all honor and glory and power because he's wonderful. Is he wonderful to you? Is he wonderful to you? Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been seeing God working this week in people's lives. It has been wonderful. It has been wonderful. You're testifying of this, right? <laughs> it has been. Guys, you at home, um, you've missed something here. You really, really have, but I know that you've been participating as well because we have seen your prayer requests come through and we have been faithfully praying for you at home. We've been faithfully praying here um, as well. Uh, and we will continue to do our special prayer time. I have a special announcement from our prayer coordinator, uh, Pastor Linda Asare. Tomorrow morning at six o'clock in this room, there will be a special prayer time. And then... We will have our pastors who will come forward at 6.30 and we'll be praying for people who need special prayer tomorrow morning. So that's for people who are here in the house. But those who are at home, you won't miss out. You just need to continue to jot your prayer out and we will always, we, will, we are faithful and we're committed to praying for you too. Now, one of the things about camp meeting is that camp meeting can feel like a bubble, Right? I, I, anyone watch the news this week? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, somebody said very loudly, no. Um, camp meetings like a bubble. You can almost forget about what's happening out there in the world. And, and that's okay. That's okay for the spiritual convocation that we are going through. But we have to go back into reality. And the fact of the matter is, is that the world is still spinning and things are still going on. Um, you'll remember... Back February the 24th, 2022, the world 
for the Ukraines changed. People were dispersed, bombs were fired, an invasion took place in the country of Ukraine. And for us, we were gripped as we saw the harrowing scenes of people having to take what they could and leave their homes. Now, I only saw on TV, like many of you here, but with us this evening, we have family from the Ukraine. We have family from the Ukraine who have family who are in the Ukraine or have had to leave the Ukraine. I've invited Vader, have I got it right? Almost. Vadim. <laughs> I am terrible with, with pronunciation, so thank you for your grace in advance. Um, Vadim is one of the elders of our Ukrainian church in London. He has family back there, and I just wanted to ask Vadim, uh, as we have this special theme of prayer this evening on the Ukraine crisis, uh, we wanted to be informed in our prayers this evening, and I uh, just wanted to ask Vadim, what is the experience for the Ukrainian people right now? Thank you for the possibility to stand here with you and uh, express this. The feeling and uh, what is happening is absolutely horrible. Mm. It's devastating that in the time of, of this development of the life that we have, some people are thriving to survive, thriving to have bread, water. They hide in the basements from constant shelling, etc. So the situation is, is crucial. It's very, very sad what is happening there. Mm. And you have family personally involved? My, my parents, they decided to remain in Ukraine. Mm. Um, praise God, they are in relatively safe place. But as we know and as we see from news, no place is safe in Ukraine at the moment. Mm. So what is happening there, um, everyone who is there are either refugees mm. or they are taking refugees, they are helping them, or as we are trying to do and we'll speak more about that later on tonight, um, particularly uh, my parents and uh, we here are involved uh, in helping as many people as we can yeah. in, the, in the war affected areas. Wow, thank you for sharing. As you've said and you've noted, this evening after our worship service, a team of you have come to actually share more um, and in the midst of that to also glorify God. So I want to invite you to stay behind after service just for an extra hour to hear the experiences and, and worship with our Ukrainian family. Pastor Anthony, you had um, another question. Yes. Um, firstly, thank you so much for Dean for being with us and to, mm. to all of you for uh, taking time out to be with us on this weekend. Um, a lot has already been done. Um, fundraising, uh, coming together, uh, resources and first aid. Uh, is there anything more uh, in your experience that could be done, uh, especially to those who are listening online and for us here, um, to support uh, those in Ukraine and those who are also looking for shelter? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, what can I say? The prayers are always the most important thing. Mm. Mm. And uh, I, I can... I cannot stress enough the importance of the prayer that we have. Mm -hmm. And when we see how God protects, especially his people, in this hard time, when we see that the area is completely blocked, nobody's coming in, nobody's coming out of the place, and we see how God protects, he takes those people, he takes his children out of those areas, that is, that is, you know, Amen. some Amen. great Amen. answers. And there are Amen. testimonies that, you know, make my back chill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to pray uh, at Thank this you. time. Is there any specific 
prayer request um, in this in this context that you'd want me to pray for? Uh, the most important is to pray for for those people who who seek uh, to to go out and to come out of the out of the blocked areas, uh, whose life is constantly endangered, mm. and um, who are hiding in the basements mm. and uh, with bombs are dropping down. So for safety, also for many people have been helping. Obviously, the help is, it can never be enough. Mm. It can never be enough. So I'm so thankful to God and to everyone who is, who is um, generous to do something for the people there. And just, just to be, uh, just to be uh, thankful more for, for God. Uh, to God and what He's doing in our hearts and with our hearts, how He opens it up, and uh, praise to God for everything. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, we have heard what Vadim has said. Um, I'm about to pray, but before I pray, um, I am literally going to ask those of us who are watching online, those of us who are here right now, to just take 20 to 30 seconds to bow your heads and to pray one for another. We're all brothers in this. Uh, when one weeps, we all weep. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. So I'm just gonna ask if we can just take 30 seconds to just pray for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, uh, for the other wars that are going on around the world. And, and those 30 seconds are up, I will then pray to close. Let's go. Let's pray. Father, we are appreciative and we recognize that you are the father of all nations. Mm. You are the God of all people. In fact, Isaiah reminds us you are the creator of the ends of the earth. And so because you are God, we come before you humbly, asking that you will continue to bring your comfort You'll continue to bring your peace to those who are living in a time of war. We ask, Father God, that you will bring protection, that you'll bring clarity of mind, that you'll increase faith where all may seem lost. Mm -hmm. We thank you for the testimony that Vadim shared, yes, where people who are being trapped are finding a way of escape. Mm -hmm. And we ask that you'll continue to make a way where there is no way. We ask that you'll continue to bring hope where the situation is dire. Mm -hmm. I hope that you will continue to remind us that there is nothing that you cannot do. It doesn't make sense why there's always war and rumors of war and why innocents have to suffer the way that they do. It hurts our hearts and we look beyond and we wonder why. But just as Isaiah said, Lord, help us to trust you with all our hearts. Mm -hmm. Has thou not known, has thou not seen that the everlasting God, the Father, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching his understanding. And so, Lord, we trust you even in the situations that make no sense. We trust you that you give power to those who have no might and to those who are in need of something special, you increase their strength. And so, Lord, we leave people your people in your hands because you do all things well. And even though, Lord, we will try our best, we will do our best, we will give and we will reach out, teach us, Lord, to be still and to know that you are God and to move when you say move and to give when you say give and to, and to allow your spirit to navigate this process. And so we thank you for the Ukrainians that are here to share their story. 
I pray that we are inspired and reminded that you still sit on the throne, even in the midst of crisis. And as we continue this service, I pray that we will continue to hold on to you. We'll continue to trust you. We'll continue to believe you. And we look forward to today. We look forward to the day. Will there be no more crying? Will there be no more death? Will there be no more war? Will there be no more bullies able to do what they want to do? Where you will come as king supreme and take your people home. And so do what needs to be done, Lord, to save us in our ups and in our downs. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. In the name of Jesus, let everybody say amen. Amen. Psalms 34 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And verse 6 says, This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. We serve a God who sees us. As Genesis 16 tells us, we serve a God who sees us. And I pray that even in the midst of all that's going on for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, even for us in our situations, all the parts of the world that we live in or the parts of England that we live in, the difficulties that we could be going through, businesses threatening to close, marriages on the rocks, children doing all sorts of things and just things not working out, health issues. I just want to encourage you that God is the God who sees. And just like he came through and he is coming through for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, he will also do the same thing for you and for me. It's nearly midnight, my heart won't make it through. I hear what they're saying about me, there's nothing I can do. Just when they told me that I was born to lose, I heard a voice and I know that it was you. It was just yesterday that I called your name. Jesus, I'm tired of living my life this way. Just look at the mess that I've made, and there's no one else to blame. And then, just when I looked up to the sky, here comes Jesus coming to save me, dressed in glory, riding on Calvary. I can see his face, it's gonna be okay. Yes, yes, here comes Jesus, and my pain is gone. I know that I can carry on now, I can smile. Because you love me You are the father That I never knew I never thought you'd be the one To make my dreams come true You took my pain away you made my life brand new and then just when I looked up to the sky here 
here comes Jesus coming to save me dressed in glory he's riding on Calvary I can see his face it's gonna be okay yes yes here comes Jesus and my pain is gone I know that I can carry on now I Because you love me It's hard to believe You came just to save me You died on Calvary Ooh, Because you love me The reason why you laid down your life And when I look up to the sky I can hear your voice And see the light again Jesus, he's coming to save me, dressed in glory, riding on Calvary, I can see his face, it's gonna be okay, yes, yes, here comes Jesus, and my pain is gone, I know that I can carry on, now I can smile. you love me here comes Jesus coming to save me dressed in glory he's riding on Calvary I can see his face it's gonna be okay yes yes here comes Jesus and my pain is gone I know that I can carry on now I can smile because you love me now I can smile because you love me so now you can smile Kayla, Michaela, Michaela. Wow. Every time you sing, I feel like just saying amen and being done, not preaching. What a blessing. What a gift. Michaela, I don't know if you know this. Where are you? You still here? Michaela, I don't know if you know this. Um, I've, I've discovered over the years that a lot of people are unaware of the fact that the Bible explicitly states not by implication, but explicitly states that God himself is a singer and a songwriter. Are you aware of that? Zephaniah 3.17, it says that, that God uh, rejoices over us with singing, with songs of love. And, and you know that God is, is singing originals, right? So that means he's a songwriter. He's not, he's not like singing, you know somebody else's songs, he's, he's writing songs. And in fact, the Bible has a number of places where there are actual songs uh, that are written by God. Just look sometime, not right now, but look sometime at Isaiah 42. And Isaiah 42 is a song that the Father, God the Father, is singing about Jesus, the Son, who he is about to send to the world and Jesus is going to suffer in the process of saving us, right? And the father says in verse 6 uh, to the son, doesn't say, he sings to the son, I will hold your hand through the whole process. This is amazing. God is a singer and a songwriter. I just can't imagine what it's going to be like uh, on the other side of this great controversy between good and evil. Imagine having our first Sabbath service. And, uh, and I don't know if there's going to be actual programs like a bulletin or something because I guess we're going to have perfect recall, perfect memories. So, so it'll just be announced and we'll know, right? But it says Jesus is delivering the sermon this Sabbath. And his topic is Calvary. 
Can you imagine hearing Jesus, first person, preach the cross? Let me tell you how it was. He's the only one who can say that. But, but then before he preaches, he says, now before I get in to the message this morning, God the Father with a choir of angels backing him up, God the Father has a special item he would like to share with us in song. Can you imagine, can you imagine hearing the voice of God himself vocalize his love for you and me in the form of singing? What will his voice be like? It's going to be incredible. It's going to be incredible. Thanks for being here this evening. Um, this is a message of importance uh, from my standpoint. It's, it's made a big difference in my life. It ho I hope that it will um, make a difference, a significant difference in your life as well. But again, the things that I want to share with you are of such gravity that uh, I feel the need for special intervention on my behalf. So because I'm a little nervous and I don't want to say anything wrong and I want to say it just right, would you just pause with me and pray one more time as I kind of just calm down? Father in heaven, thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you for promising to come close to us when we gather together like this. Thank you for promising to send your spirit to attend our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, and to prompt us to think and to feel in the right direction. I pray, Father, that you would give us more than human understanding right now, that we would see things with a level of clarity that we would not be able to just go on with religion as usual. So please help us right now in our weakness. We are fragile, Lord. We are wounded. Speak to us with, with clarity in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a few years ago, a friend of mine heard that I was heading over to another part of Europe to do a series of meetings. And so he came to me all excited. He said, hey, I heard you're going over to Europe in May to, to preach a series. And I, I said, yeah, I'm going over there. And he said, you're not going to believe this. He was full of enthusiasm and excitement about, you're not going to believe this, he said. You're not going to believe this. And then he told me that there's a brother in Europe who owns something. I'm going to play a word game with you right now. And I'm going to say a word, get your hand ready, shoot your hand in the sky if you know what this word refers to. Little word game. Is your hand ready? Yeah. I don't see your hands ready. Get your hand ready. Okay, so I'm going to say a word. It may be a familiar word. It may be an unfamiliar word. But if you know what the word refers to, if you know what the word means, raise your hand. Here's the word. Are you ready? Bugatti. Oh, less than 10 people. Maybe seven, maybe six Hardly anybody, and actually a couple of females who know what it, I'll bet you heard me preach about this before. Nobody knows what that word refers to. It's an exotic Italian pasta, of course. No, it's not. I'm going to show you a Bugatti. Are you ready? Look at the screen. Here's a Bugatti. <laughs> what is a Bugatti? Oh, somebody, oh, a lot of you said a car. Do not insult the Bugatti by calling the Bugatti a mere car. This is not a car. You, you can call it a lot of things. Do not call it a car. You can call it a work of art. You can call it an engineering wonder. You can call it a driving machine even, but you may not insult the Bugatti by calling it a car. Don't do it. Never again. So what is a Bugatti? Well, first of all, a Bugatti, a Bugatti is a driving machine that if you want one, it will cost you $2 million. That, that's the base amount. If you want some additional amenities like a great stereo system or something like that, $2.2 million. So this friend of mine, he said, I heard you're going over there. I said, yeah, I'm going over there. And I thought, why are you so interested in where I'm going? He said, are you aware that we have a brother over there where you're going? You're going to be within just miles of him. There's a brother 
pause, parenthetical statement. By brother, he means a fellow Seventh-day Adventist in this context. There's a brother over there, and he owns a Bugatti. I was just like, whoa, really? You're kidding. What's a Bugatti? I didn't know what it was. I did not know what it was. Um, I think at that time we had a Prius, which is a car, and it's not an insult to call a Prius a car. It's, a, it's nothing, actually. I mean, you can't even go anywhere in style in a Prius. I said, so what's a Bugatti? And then he showed me this picture on his phone. He said, this is a Bugatti, man. Where have you been? This is a Bugatti. This is a Bugatti, you guys, and it costs $2 million if you want one. Um, the Bugatti, if the tank is full of gas, it will be empty in 14 minutes at top speed. And the tires will be completely bald and need to be replaced at 16 minutes. So it's really important that you run out of fuel at 14 minutes. And then when your tires need to be replaced, it will cost you $44,000 to replace four tires. And you don't go to the local tire shop. You have to put it on a flatbed trailer or a covered trailer of some kind, and you have to ship your car for the tires to the factory where the Bugatti is made. This is amazing. The Bugatti at type, top speed only gets about six to seven miles per gallon. It's not a fuel-efficient car. It is, by many um, tests that have been done, the fastest street-legal car on Earth. Now, this is a competition, and sometimes there have been points at which another manu car manufacturer has come up with a car that goes a little faster than the Bugatti, and then the Bugatti just gives a wink and a nod, and then the engineers go to work, and they beat everybody again. Now, when I went to this place, I had that in my mind. There's a brother here that owns one of these, a $2 million car. I need to find this guy. Well, he was attending my meetings. I didn't know what he even looked like, but he was described to me by my friend. So when this brother came up to me with his wife and said, hey, welcome to the area. Would you like to come to our house for lunch someday while you're here? I said, let me think about it, sure. Yeah, when? Tomorrow? So my wife Sue and I, we went to the house, this big palatial house with, with all kinds of things I've never seen before. And we went in the house and we started having lunch and they had a newborn baby. Aren't newborn babies adorable? Do you like newborn babies? Not really? This guy doesn't like them. Okay, so they're saying, oh, our baby, look at our baby. Our baby's amazing. Look at our baby, our baby, our baby, our baby. I'm like, oh, you have such a beautiful baby. Dude, where's the Bugatti? <laughs> okay, I get the enthusiasm about the child, but where is the Bugatti, bro? And he said, you heard about the Bugatti? I said, yes, I heard about the Bugatti. He said, would you like to see it? And I said, yes, I would like to see it. So he took us outside, and he pushed a button, and a garage door opened, and there was a Rolls Royce. I said, that's not it. <laughs> he pushed another button, and the second garage door opened, and there was a Lamborghini. I said, ah, oh, we're getting close. That's not it. He pushed another button, and there was some kind of Porsche. I don't know what it was. And then finally, he pushed a button, and there was a royal blue Bugatti. And he said, would you like me to pull it out of the garage so you can take a look at it? I said, well, yes, actually. I would like for you to pull the out. Now, I need to take you back to my friend. My friend said, there's a brother who owns a Bugatti. And I said, what's a Bugatti? He showed me this picture. He told me about the car. I said, if there is a Seventh-day Adventist on earth that owns one of those, I'm telling you, I'm driving it. And he said, you'll never drive it because, because, because the rumor is that nobody drives the Bugatti but the brother himself. His wife's never even driven it. You're not driving it, Ty. I said, are you telling me there's a Seventh-day Adventist that owns one of these? He said, yes. Are you telling me that I'm going over by where he lives? Yes. I said, I'm driving that Bugatti. And we made a bet. We're not supposed to, but we did. If I lose, I'll give you a dollar if I don't drive it. If I win, you give $10,000 to our ministry. That's a fair bet. 
So he pulled the Bugatti out and we're looking at it. My wife Sue and I were coming from all angles and we're standing there just observing and he's telling us the details about it. And so finally I, 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 see, my, I see my open and I say, hey, 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 bro, could I drive the Bugatti? And he said, no. <laughs> kind of laughed. I said, brother, that's not funny. What do you mean I can't drive the Bugatti? He said, of course you can't drive the Bugatti. Do you know how much this car costs? I said, yeah, I Googled it. Of course I know how much it costs. You can't, you can't drive it. I said, brother, why can't I drive the Bugatti? I, I, I see this as an opportunity to raise the quality of my life right now. And you are denying me. He said, no, I'm sorry, man. Nobody's driven it but me. It's very expensive. The insurance, no, you can't drive the Bugatti. I said, bro, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? He said, yes, I am. What's that got to do with it? I said, are you a Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist? He said, yeah. I said, have you read Acts chapter 2? He said, well, I've read the whole Bible, so apparently I have, but I can't remember what it says. I said, well, I conveniently do remember what it says. It says of the body of Christ that they had all things common. So, bro, if you're a Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist, the truth of the matter is, is that your Bugatti is my Bugatti. It's our Bugatti. This Bugatti belongs to the church of God, brother, and I don't see why I can't drive our Bugatti. And he said, no, man, you can't drive the Bugatti. And then I got one last idea. I said, brother, listen, if you let me drive the Bugatti, I will use the story in a sermon illustration and people will be one to the Lord. And he said, okay, you can drive it. I thought it was that easy. Why didn't I come up with that sooner? And then I noticed him looking right past my face where my wife was standing. And the whole time my wife was there as I looked at her, and we have a good marriage, and I don't know why she felt at liberty to betray me. The whole time she was standing there saying, do not let my husband drive the Bugatti. Just because I've had a few car accidents over the year at top speed. So he said, okay, let's go. And he got in the driver's seat, and we went out on a straightaway, and he said, are you ready? I said, bro, I was born ready. Yes. And he floored it. And I felt, <clears throat> felt G-force. You know what G-force is? G-force is when you feel your bottom pull into the seat. He finally pulled over, and he said, it's your turn. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> and we switched sides, and I got in the driver's seat, and we began driving, getting speed up a little more, a little more. He said, well, I suppose you want to I said, yeah, I, I do want to. I said, but I need your permission because you think it's yours. And he finally said, yeah, okay, go ahead. And I floored it. And we went so fast, so fast. Do you know what I mean by that? So fast, so fast. We picked up speed so fast that I was terrified. I couldn't even look down to see any of the gauges to find out what was going on because I couldn't. I was so afraid and so happy. It was the perfect combination between terror and fun. We slowed down. We took the driving machine back to his house. And as we were driving, I said, should we stop and fill it up with gas? He said, fill it up with gas? No. This is a Bugatti, and it only operates on a very high-octane special fuel source. You can't put any fuel you want into it. I said, oh, okay. And we took it back to the house, and that was my Bugatti experience. And I'm making good on my word right now to tell you the story. But I'm telling you the story with an agenda because the Apostle Paul understood the Bugatti-ness of the human being. For we through the Spirit, Paul said, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. 
righteousness by faith. That's our term tonight, righteousness by faith. This is the only place in the Bible where the term righteousness by faith occurs, but the idea is replete throughout Scripture. You'll encounter this idea with other language, like justification by faith, or reconciliation, or salvation by grace through faith. The idea is pervasive in Scripture, but this is the only time that the term itself, righteousness by faith, occurs. I want you to notice that Paul says that righteousness by faith is something that we eagerly wait for. We're enthusiastic about it. We want it. We hope for it. But here's the thing about righteousness by faith. Righteousness, the righteousness part of the equation is not something over which you and I have any jurisdiction. In other words, you can't generate or produce righteousness in and of yourself. Jesus described it like this. He said, speaking a little parable as he normally did, Jesus said, which one of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? In other words, which one of you, by thinking hard enough, can get taller? What's the obviously implied answer? It's a rhetorical question. Nobody can. Nobody can. You can't get taller by thinking hard enough. So Jesus follows this up by saying, neither can you who are accustomed to doing evil do good. Well, that's the brutal fact of the matter. You and I are morally bankrupt. If left to ourselves, we cannot produce righteousness. Now think of the frustration and the failure that we produce by challenging people who can't achieve righteousness to be righteous. Think of the cycle of defeat that we produce when we fail to preach the good news of the gospel, but in its place preach moralism and legalism until the person tries and tries and tries and fails and fails and fails and finally either has to lie to themselves and become a self-righteous Pharisee or give up in despair because they don't want to be a hypocrite and leave the church. Righteousness is a part of the equation that you and I have no power over. And righteousness, therefore, Paul says, is by another means Righteousness isn't something that you and I can generate by trying hard enough. It is by faith. But faith itself is not something that you and I can generate by trying hard enough. So the next verse is the key to the righteousness by faith equation. Here Paul says, we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then he says, verse 6, for in Christ Jesus neither nor avails anything. But what does avail, Paul? Faith working through love. Now, in the blanks, Paul has circumcision, uncircumcision. That was a hot-button theological issue at his time. It is not a hot-button theological issue of our time. I'm going to suggest to you that you can literally put anything in these blanks and the statement remains true. You can literally put anything there. We eagerly wait for righteousness by faith, for in Christ Jesus neither, just name anything, Sabbath keeping or Sunday keeping, doesn't avail anything for salvation. There's only one thing that avails, and that is faith working through love. Now, Paul does something very fascinating here. The word working here, faith working through love, is the Greek word energio or energeo, from which we get the English equivalent energy. Literally, Paul says in his master stroke of theological genius, Paul says righteousness is by faith, and faith is energized by love. So if I can't produce righteousness by trying hard enough, and I can't work up faith inside of myself into activity, 
Where do I, as a morally bankrupt, fallen human being, completely impotent and incapable of righteousness and incapable of exercising faith if left to myself, where in the equation do I need to focus my attention on the love part of the equation? I need to fuel up with the optimal energy source in order to produce the activity of faith and achieve righteousness. Ellen White received a letter one time when the subject of righteousness by faith was being hotly debated in Adventism. And the letter she received had a simple question. What, Ellen White, what is righteousness by faith? She wrote back and she didn't give a highfalutin theological answer. She didn't point to a systematic theology textbook. Ellen White, what is righteousness by faith? She said, I'll tell you what it is, and I'm quoting, these are her words, not mine. She said, it is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what Paul said in Galatians 5, verses 5 and 6? We eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, and he says that the Spirit is involved in generating that desire inside of us. The Holy Spirit actively awakens the love of Christ in our hearts, and that love is the high-octane fuel source upon which the human being operates at the optimal level. So let's ask another simple question. What is a human being? Well, first of all, we are biological creatures. I have a body. You have a body. That's the part of me that you see. That's the part of you that I see. We have a physical shell. We have a body. This body also is equipped with a brain, which is a physical organ. It is a part of the body. But in the brain, something phenomenal occurs that is non-material. It is generated by neurological activity on the biological level, but it is immaterial, and it is called mind. Mind, thoughts, feelings. You can take a brain out of a human skull, post-mortem preferably, put it on a table and cut into it, dissect it, investigate it. It's a physical thing a brain is. You can't take a thought or a feeling or a motive and put it on a table and cut into it with a knife. It's not a physical thing. It's a non-physical phenomenon that is generated by the physical activities of the brain. So a human being is a physical creature. A human being is a mental creature. A human being is an emotional creature. So let's ask the question on a little bit of a deeper level. What is the power, the fuel, the energy that fuels human flourishing. What is the specific fuel source that God Almighty designed to mentally and emotionally power the human being? Well, I'd like to get at that question by looking at the research of Dean Ornish. Dr. Dean Ornish is the Harvard graduate physician, world famous, New York Times best-selling author, who years ago is the guy who demonstrated in controlled studies that you can reverse heart disease by simply eating actual food and moving your body. Very, very high science here but he demonstrated that you can actually remove plaque from the arteries by eating the right kinds of food and exercising, right? That's his claim to fame. But this book was his real love. This was his real research project that he was doing kind of behind the scenes for 20 years before he released this book. This book sat at the New York Times bestseller list for months. It was translated into multiple language, languages. Notice the very provocative title of the book, Love and Survival. The juxtaposition of those two words, love and survival, is a stroke of book title genius. Notice the subtitle, if you can read it, The Scientific Basis for the Healing Power of Intimacy. Dr. Dean Ornish is not a believer as far as I know. He's a scientist. There's no theology in the book. He has no theological agenda. He never quotes the Bible. That's not his point. 
But Dr. Dean Ornish tells us what he discovered after 20 years of research on the healing power of intimacy, the healing power of love. He says anything that promotes, notice the language carefully, anything that promotes feelings of love and intimacy is healing. And by healing, he means biologically healing, physically healing. Now check this out. Anything that promotes isolation, separation, loneliness, loss, hostility, anger, cynicism, depression, alienation, and related, note the word again, feelings, often leads to suffering, disease, and premature death from all causes. This is science. This isn't theology. It is theology. Dr. Dean Ornish just doesn't know it. He has simply discovered what a human being is and what the primary energy source is that fuels human flourishing. He has scientifically discovered the truth of righteousness by faith, and he doesn't know it. Well, he goes on and says, the scientific evidence leaves little doubt that love and intimacy are powerful determinants of our health and survival. And then he says this, why they have such an impact remains somewhat a mystery. He's just reporting the facts of the case to us, but he doesn't know why we are this way. He's essentially saying human beings are psychologically and biologically engineered for love, but we don't know why. It's a mystery because human beings, in his worldview, shouldn't be like this. Because in his worldview, we are merely evolutionary animals. And the highest law of human nature is survival of the fittest. So you would think that the human being would be psychologically and biologically wired for flourishing on the fuel of selfishness. But no, the moment we begin to engage in selfish motives and thoughts and feelings, we begin to die biologically. And Dr. Ornish has discovered this. Now, through Dr. Ornish's research and the research of a number of other scientists, I have compiled a conclusion that is the sum total of everything that this research reveals. And that is that human beings can be understood to have what we might call a malfunction region of experience and an optimization region of experience. By malfunction, scientists have identified that these things actually depress the immune system and make a human being susceptible to disease. Racism, loneliness, isolation, envy, greed, hate, and anger. All of these have something in common. They can all be summarized as self-centeredness. Now, on the other hand, if a human being begins to move in their relational dynamics into a different kind of thought and feeling process, these kinds of things actually improve the immune system and make the human being resistant to illness and disease. Generosity acceptance, kindness, forgiveness, loyalty, faithfulness, and giving. And all of these things have something in common. They are other-centered in their orientation. Now, what this means, quite simply, is that you are not merely a biological survival machine made for consuming calories and having sex. That's the materialistic worldview you are made for something higher. You are a dignified creature of the divine image. You are engineered at all levels to feed upon the fuel of God's love. And that love empowers you in ways emotionally, psychologically, 
volitionally, on all levels, you become empowered when you are engaged in a steady intake of love and a steady outgiving, outgoing flow of love. To summarize, you're basically made to give and to receive love. And apart from that reciprocal flow of outgoing, incoming love, biologically, your immune system becomes compromised and you gradually begin to wither. You experience stress, anxiety, depression. You begin to shut down, to back up, to create distance. You go into isolation when you are not optimized by love. So you are not a biological survival machine. You are, quite frankly, a love machine. Just get used to it. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm a love machine. Go ahead, I'm waiting. Now, don't do it in a creepy way. Don't do it in a creepy way. No creepiness in the house. Okay, 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 that was a little weird. But the point is that you and I are made to give and to receive love. So I'm gonna suggest to you that righteousness by faith is the highest form of healing psychology. That we who are believers in the good news of the gospel of Christ have something more than merely a doctrine to offer the world, we have a healing psychology to offer to the world. We have, we have the opportunity to, to invite people into a quality of love that has no perfectly satisfying match in this world. So Paul puts it like this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, or that word judge is better translated, we discern or we perceive something. What do we perceive? What do we discern? What do we judge? That if one died, that's Jesus, then all died. This is very, very deep, what Paul is saying here. What does he mean that when Jesus died, everybody died? Well, when Jesus died, he died as the representative head of the human race, as the last Adam. Jesus, when he died, did so for all, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But watch where Paul goes with this. The love of Christ compels us. It propels us. It motivates us. The love of Christ causes us to be able to do things that otherwise, apart from this love, we would not be able to do. The love of Christ compels us because we discern something and we believe it, that if one died for all, then all died. Now watch this. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for who? For themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Do you see what's happening here? Paul says that the love of Christ, when it is judged, when it is discerned, when it is perceived, when I grasp that his love is universal for all, that when he died, he died for every human being, when I believe that his love is like that, the power of self-centeredness is broken. The spell of selfishness is broken over my heart and I begin for the first time in my life to look outward to him and to others. I become a different kind of creature. I become the kind of person who is a conduit through whom the love of Christ can flow out to others. How do we know this is what he means? Well, he literally is telling us that God's love exerts a creative power. It remakes us in the image of God from which we have fallen. So he goes on, or excuse me, Ellen White inserting here. By the way, I don't put quote marks because everything on the slide, both Bible verses and other quotes, it's all quoted word for word from the books. Uh, there are no words of mine, so there are no quote marks necessary. So this is word for word 
from the writings of Ellen White. She says, love is power. What kind of power, Ellen? Intellectual and moral strength are involved in this principle. Grammatically, this principle refers back to what? Love. It says that intellectual and moral strength are involved in this principle and cannot be separated from it. Watch this. Love cannot live without action. And every act increases, strengthens, and extends it. Love will gain the victory. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. If you fall in love, everything's possible for you. In the light of God's love for you, if you begin to see and to discern his love for you and you begin to find spontaneously in your heart, you find yourself saying, God, if you love me like that, I love you back. That, that transformation of motivational center is the key factor of transformation in the gospel. So Paul goes on in the 2 Corinthians 5 text. Therefore, he says, what is the therefore referred back to? If Jesus died for how many? For all, therefore from now on, from now on, from the point at which I realize he loves everybody, died for everybody, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. What? That's a complex bit of language. What does he mean? We were, well, the word flesh there is carne, from which we get words like carnal. Literally what this means is he says, he's saying, listen, the moment you see God's love for you and you believe it and you realize that all human beings are the objects of God's love, you will from that point forward stop relating to people as if they were sinners, you will stop living in that reflexive mode of judgment and condemnation and incrimination. You will cease regarding people according to their natural carnality. You will begin relating to people the way he has related to you. I relate to people the way God has related to me. How has he related to me? Well, I happen to be standing here before you. I am not destroyed. I exist, I draw breath, I have cognitive function, I eat delicious food, I hang out with my family and friends. My life, whether I am a believer or an unbeliever, has been spared by the sacrifice of Christ. The only difference between me and an unbeliever is that it's dawned on me. But if I relate to unbelievers as if they were innocent, I create the relational climate in which they might open up to receive his love as well. So he goes on and he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have, past tense, passed away. Behold, all things become new. Past tense. The gospel is always a description of past tense realities. It is always the holy history of Jesus Christ and what he by himself, apart from any contribution you and I could make, he achieved our salvation by his grace alone so that it is only by faith alone that we become saved. And then he says this, now... All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Do not miss this part. Here's Paul's theology. That is, he wants to clarify now. Sometimes you say something and you realize, ah, oh, that wasn't as clear as I wanted it to be. So you're going to loop back. That is, now he's going to clarify that God was in Christ reconciling who? Who? The world. Every single member of the human race, every man, woman, and child, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. How did he do it? By not imputing their trespasses to them and has given us the word of reconciliation. What is the reconciliation 
with which he has related to the world, to not count men's sins against them. That's how the NIV renders this. The reconciling action on God's part is to not hold us under condemnation for our sins. How many people is God relating to with this non-condemnatory posture? According to the text, the whole world. Every single person that you pass on the highway and look over and there they are and they just cut you off and you want to flip them off. Jesus died for that person. The person you hand your money to as you buy your groceries, your ridiculously crazy uncle, Frank. Jesus died for him. You don't want him coming over for Christmas dinner, but Jesus died for him. And when you realize that Jesus died for all and that his love is universal for all, it changes the way you see people. You're like, wow, you are the object of God's unconditional, lavish love. God himself would rather die forever than to live without you, Uncle Frank. And so then we adopt a ministry, a word of reconciliation. If God reconciled me to himself by not counting my sins against me, what is my posture to be toward others in my relationships with them? A posture of mercy and compassion and forgiveness. God reconciled the whole world to himself in Christ by not counting our sins against us. How then are we called to relate to the world? Paul concludes... Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. This is heavy stuff. What's an ambassador? Well, the definition, according to the dictionary, of an ambassador is, quote, unquote, the highest ranking representative from one government to another, end quote. What is an ambassador? Again, the highest ranking representative from one government to another. What are you? You're an ambassador for Christ, for the kingdom of Christ. You are the highest ranking representative of Christ to the unbelieving world. And what is the nature or quality of our representation, of our ambassadorship? He has reconciled the world to himself and now we have the word and the ministry of reconciliation to love others the way Jesus loved them. And loving people the way Jesus loved them is attractive. It's empowering. Be reconciled to God, Paul says, on the premise that God is already reconciled to you. We don't preach to the world, you need to do something to get right with God. We preach to the world, God has gotten right with you. He's not holding anything against you. He loves you. Come on in to his fellowship. Come on in to relationship with the God of the universe. He's already reconciled to you. So why not reciprocate and lay down your hostility and enmity against him in the light of his love for you. For he made him, the father made the son who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is amazing, you guys. That's the experiential part. Now, I want to just briefly introduce two words into your, your vocabulary if they're not there already. These are complex words that, in a theological sense, are challenging at first glance to understand. Within the scope of the gospel, or what we call the plan of salvation, let's call it, there is the objective dimension and there is the subjective dimension. The objective dimension is described by Paul in Romans 3.24 when he speaks of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Where is it located, this redemption? It's in him. I don't manufacture it. I don't earn it. I can't merit it. There's nothing I can do to earn God's favor, I said on a previous evening, simply and profoundly because you already have God's favor. 
You can't make God love you more than he already does because he already loves you with all his love. And there's nothing you can do to change the fact that even if you say no to him, he died for you. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus is the objective facts of the gospel. It is the description of a historical enacting of love real time on the stage of human history. 2,000 years ago, God became a human being and loved all of us to the utter end of himself. He gave himself in totality for you and me and thereby put on display a selfless quality of love that is redemptive experientially when we believe it. And that's the subjective part. The objective part is the simple and profound facts of what Jesus has already accomplished for you and me. The subjective part is me experiencing that by believing it and walking in it. If I confuse the subjective part with the objective part, I become a pagan. If I focus on the human part of the equation to the exclusion or minimizing of God's part of the equation, I produce in the church of God individuals that feel obligated but not attracted. I produce people who feel duty-bound but are powerless to be dutiful. I produce either hypocrites or people who sink into despair. The only way to preach the gospel is to preach the achievements of Christ on behalf of the human race as a whole. My belief in that historical reality is not the gospel. It is to believe the gospel. There's the gospel over there, and here's me believing it. I, by my obedience, my victory, my veganism, my Sabbath keeping, my whatever, whatever the list happens to be, I add no new data to the gospel. I add no new facts. I generate no power. I produce no salvation by anything I might do. My salvation is an accomplished historical fact, objectively, empirically, in Christ. When I believe that gospel, it opens my heart up and I begin to love him back. I become the Bugatti I was always meant to be. Now, it's up to you. You can keep your Bugatti with an empty tank and push it around if you want. And you'll get exhausted no matter how beautiful this work of art is. Or you can fuel up with the power of God's love manifested in Christ and the gospel, and you will find yourself reaching optimal operation. You will find yourself able to reach the highest possible velocity in your spiritual development. You will grow exponentially as you drink in the high-octane fuel of God's love as the only possible source of your repair, your healing, your salvation. You are a love machine. You are a Bugatti of the highest engineered sophistication imaginable. The only thing you need is to keep on drinking in a steady, steady, steady intake of the love of God manifested in Christ, and then you will experience Paul's master equation. Righteousness is by faith, and faith is fueled by the love of God in Christ.
Thank you very much, Pastor Ty, for this beautiful message. And uh, I was uh, about to wish you all happy Sabbath, but then I realized Sabbath starts at 9 o'clock. Uh, so is it now time? Well, almost there, but happy Sabbath, everybody. Yeah. Maybe you should turn to a person next to you, you know, and just say happy Sabbath. You know, fist bump or whatever it is. Um, we are so glad that to everybody online, uh, I think it's time for you to let us know uh, where you're wishing sa happy Sabbath from. And, um, and just uh, for a few moments, we would like to just uh, remember the beginning of this beautiful day. This evening, uh, the program actually will continue on the same uh, YouTube link for those who are with us online. Uh, but we will give you opportunity to have a break if you need one. But what we want to do is, if I just ask Ukrainian musicians, if I can just ask Ukrainian musicians to come up and plug the instruments, like right now. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, they, they are going to share a, a song with us. Just continue with setting up, guys. And um, this evening, uh, talk show is going to be really an interview between these people here, which we have with us, and uh, Nana Bonnie. Uh, so uh, today, this will be a little bit different than usually that we do. But certainly, uh, we can promise you one thing, that you will truly be blessed and that you will get to know some amazing people uh, through the interview uh, from the Ukrainian group. Uh, so can I just ask, um, uh, uh, just for a few moments, uh, uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, is, it, uh, is everything okay? All right. So, very good. We are getting there. We are setting up our sound. We want to make sure, guys, that you're doing, uh, that you get the best sound possible. But you need to know it takes a few moments to do so. So, I just want to hear how many languages do, you, do we speak in this, in this room here? Uh, anybody speaking two languages here? Put a hand up here. Let me just, two languages, two languages. All right. Anybody speaks three languages? Wow. There's somebody still holding the hand. Anybody speaks four languages? Wow, still hand up. Five languages? You speaking five languages? Uh, uh, you need to put a hand down, stop showing off. Uh, uh, I struggle with one, uh, but certainly uh, we would love to hear in your language, how do you, well, whichever language you want to, how do you say happy Sabbath in your language, you just shout. Wow, wow, wow. I need, to, I, I need you to come here and just uh, say that for a moment, if that's right, because uh, I could not hear. I apologize to the team, which... Uh, t tell us happy Sabbath in your language, just for a moment. Well, my language is English. It's been for the last several years. Very good. Uh, uh, we, have a, we have an Englishman here uh, said happy Sabbath. Here it is. Pick a number from one to five. Pick a number from one to five. Uh, what's number three? Uh, Feliz Sabado. All right, all right, right. Well, uh, that is how uh, Happy Sabbath sounds in that language. Uh, let me just hear, can I see, uh, how do you say Happy Sabbath in Ukrainian? Oh, sorry. <laughs> all right. Uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, in my language it says, uh, we, we don't even have a saying for Happy Sabbath, but we just say uh, Sabbath blessing, which is uh, Boji Blagoslov. So uh, I come from Serbia. So, my friends, um, uh, this is the group that will tonight be with us, and Anna Boni will actually run the interviews uh, uh, with them, and you will hear beautiful stories and uh, what the God is doing in their life. But you need to know one thing about Ukrainians that I learned very quickly. Uh, they are amazing musicians. And it's actually, I think, by percentage of people in the country, they have an extremely high level of musicians. So, this is one of the group we have here, and, uh, uh, and we are so glad that you're with us. So, we just want to Ask blesses, and then after that, we'll ask Nana Boni to come straight after, and then we're going to continue. In case you need a break, we fully understand. We will not judge you. Are you leaving us? No, I'm sorry. sorry. That, that was no, no. So we'll not judge you. So if you have a break, just slip outside and do come back because tonight is going to be beautiful. Uh, yes, we can. Let us bow our heads and pray. And what are we going to do if that's okay? Would you mind please praying for in Ukrainian for us? Thank you. Yes, let's bow our heads. Дорогий батько, ми схиляємось перед тобою, дякуємо тобі за можливість славити тебе, роздумувати про слово твоє святе і бути з твоїм народом. Будь з нами, просимо ім'я Ісуса Христа. Амінь. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.
prefer to get... We're almost there. No bass? Still no bass? <laughs> maybe we can go without bass. Maybe we can and go without <laughs> bass. <laughs> and maybe this is the moment for you to imagine the bass. <laughs> uh, so there is a man who's going to play and as as, we, as they hear the song, we'll try okay. to fix it, that. But thank you so much, yeah. Are we having a... Uh, all right. I would just like to say, as we're trying to add the ba bass here, uh, I'm really, really proud of the praise team, uh, which we had with us. Uh, if you look them, the average age is probably 16. Uh, no, no, it's not, actually. It's probably about, about 25. You need to know, they used to be teenagers when I was a teens director in SEC. And when I came here and I watched, saw them worship lead at the camp meeting of South England Conference, I was one very proud pastor. And so I just want to say it is so beautiful to have you. And thank you so much for the help. That good-looking man was uh, playing for us uh, when he was uh, that size approximately. <laughs> God bless you. The time is yours. You can hear me. Good evening. Um, sometimes you, as, as people, we don't actually value peace until we have experienced war. And um, I had the privilege of meeting Vadim a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was invited to the Ukrainian church. And when I got there, three minutes after I walked in, 
The pastor said, no, no, you are preaching. I didn't go there to preach. But the rest was his trip. I'm just going to go straight to the, the question, Yavadim. Um, earlier on, I think a few questions were asked. I just want to go straight into the question because we, I know we are pressed with time. Have we had any refugees? Oh, and I'm sorry to use the word refugees. Have we had friends and family joining the church within this period? I mean, coming to UK to join them. Because I know we have the Ukrainian SDA church. And you worship in London? Yes. So, um, basically, there is an organized Ukrainian uh, Seventh-day Adventist church in London. And uh, we've been gathering for over two years. Actually, this summer we'll celebrate our third year anniversary, which I invite you all. <laughs> um, but... Um, since the war had started, our church had to had grown dramatically, and that's basically because people are are running away from the war. And my next question, um, I know, and I'm going to be bringing your pastor shortly. I know your pastor has been going to Ukraine during this war, and you know there is a video of him even preaching at Trafalgar, and um, now. In terms of the mothers or the, the young people, the children in the church, um, how or what can I say, let me put it this way, have members of your church lost relatives in this war? I know people who lost their relatives. I know Seventh-day Adventists who lost their relatives and friends. Um, they are distant people because obviously there are our closer communities which we know of very well but there as well are people who we kind of know but uh, we're not you know, Close. interacting uh, in our day-to-day -day life with them but there definitely are the people All who right. lost their dear ones there i'm just going to ask the media team to play um, so basically tonight we are looking at the miracles of God through the Ukraine war. We're going to see a video here. If you don't see the subtitles, I'm going to try and bring the story out. And then I'm going to ask Vadim a question. So um, multimedia team, if you're ready, can you please um, play the first video? And I want you to watch this. Um, we are looking at how God has been gracious to his people during the war in Ukraine. Thank you. 
производные государственной власти. Hello. So we we taking the sound down a bit. So I mean, some of you can't read um, from where you are seated. But the story here is um, the the Adventist Church in Ukraine during the early part of the war. They gathered in the church. They decided to come to the church. First, there was eight people. Later on, they turned to 32 people, and they were all hiding in the basement. There was a young man who used to come to the basement and then bake bread because they ran out of food and provisions. So he would run in the midst of the, I mean, the rockets, the, the, the gunfire, and then go and bake bread and then bring it to them. And one day he came and he said to the pastor, Pastor, I want to get baptized. Please, I want to get baptized. So the pastor had to um, hit the baptismal pool and everyone had to come out. I mean, all the people there. And then they baptized the young man. And um, the story goes on. But the reason I, 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 because I realized you cannot um, read the subtitles for here. We thought we would just um, share the story with you. Now, I was asking my friend here, um, the big question, I was asking my good friend here, how is the young man doing? Because I want to know what happened to him after the baptism. Um, I've been told to move a little bit. Okay. So, okay, he's us telling the story. A young guy heard about worries, and then he decided to help. So, um, they ran out of electricity. They didn't have flour. Um, and then she would do the baking. So, they used to bake six loaves of bread every night. And then um, he would come in spite of the shelling. In spite of the whole situation, he will come and then bring them food. Um, that's, 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 that's the story there. I can't tell you the joy when during the war, something crazy is going all around and you take hot bread um, in your hands. And then, you know, you can smell good food. And then um, it fills you with strength and understanding that God is actually near. The Lord cares. Um, for all of us. The guy who had been carrying the bread for a while before was telling us that he wants to be baptized, but it had been put off because of the various circumstances. And when the war started, you know, he brought his bread again. He came up to, because her husband was the pastor, and then they held the baptism in the hall where um, the baptism takes place. You can see the young man there. Um, during the baptism, there were still explosions. They heated the water. And then, um, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to stop the video here because there's another, that's the young man getting baptized. I'm going to come up with this, continue with the story. But I just want to go back to Vadim. Um, if pastor Vasil is here. Pastor, please join me. Pastor Vasil is the pastor for the Ukrainian church. And during this um, period, this 100 days of the war, pastor, how many times have you been to, back to Ukraine? Uh, good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Uh, from, this time, from the time the war started, I've been there three times at the moment. So, Pastor, you go there with, what, what, what items do you take with you when you go uh, there? I've been there a uh, few times to take the humanitarian help, which needed for the people, and uh, medica, medic, uh, medicaments and other stuff like um, uh, sleeping bags, like uh, um, sanitarium for the women, for children. And we were just giving that straight away for the refugees, for the people who are in need, and we were sending to the front line. So, Pastor, I just want to ask you, what are some of the dangers you face when you're going to the war zone to provide this? What's, what's the danger you face? What's some of the things you've seen? Um, I've been mainly in the West country, where it's a less dangerous place. But the last time when I've been in the Lvov and Ternopil, I was sitting with my friend, and the rocket was just flying on top of us and passing, and we just heard in a few minutes after that that they are shooting in Lvov and the uh, Carpathian region. And that was quite a little bit scary. And if I may ask, have you experienced any miracle in the course of doing this? Can you share any testimony of a miracle uh, that happened? The many times when I've been there, uh, with the, meeting with the people many times, I just... Um, the last time I met my friend, on the, he was coming back home and by stop. And I stopped, I saw him, he didn't see me. And I just picked him up on my van and 
he said, sorry, I couldn't, I didn't see because my head is how to help my son. And his son is on the front line. He is there in the war. And he said, during this evening, uh, the van is going to the front line taking the help. And they ask for the medicaments. And I don't have money how to take them, where to buy them, and how to send it to him. Because the soldiers near him, he's the commander, and soldiers around him, and the people around him, they don't have any painkillers and other stuff. I said, okay, God bless you. I have about three bags of the medicaments. And I just sent, gave it to him on that Friday afternoon. And the Friday night, that went straight to the front line. And I saw how God is leading just on time giving people help. Amen. Do you have young people from the Adventist Church who are supporting or helping? Have you, have you had experience anything like that? Uh, we have so many young people working as the volunteers in Ukraine. They're helping a lot. They're going, taking that humanitarian help which is delivered to the west of Ukraine. They load the day vans and take to the east of Ukraine, to south of Ukraine, where is the most difficult part at the moment, the hot lines. And they are taking that and helping people that have so many experience how God is helping them to avoid any problems. All right. And the final question, do, you, do, do, do some of these young people connect with you and ask you for prayer? Uh, some of the young people who are at the war, as the soldiers at the moment, when I've been a young, I'm not very old now, but um, I mean when about 30 years ago, <laughs> Uh, they've been in the church as the young, as the youth. But we know that many young people sometimes leave the church. They left the church at the time, and now they're in the war. At the moment, they're calling me because they know that I am pastor, and they ask for the prayer. They ask for help. Every week, I am in contact with them, and they say, we believe that God is with us. Amen. He is helping us and saving our lives, and we believe when they come back, they would come back to the church, to Amen. God. Amen. We're going to have one special testimony, and then we're going to ask what we can do for them. But before we do that, can I ask the musicians to come up, and then please give us a special song. So track one. Тобі, Господь, життя віддати хочу, лише тобі довірити спішу.
Thank you. Um, Vadim, um, we want to thank you and your team for coming. Um, we just, I just want to ask if there is anyone watching this, anyone um, online or in here who wants to support the Ukrainian um, community. Um, what projects are you working on? Pastor Vasil, do you mind joining me here? What, program, what projects are you, is your church? Obviously, I know your church is doing a lot to support um, the community back home. You know, I heard yeah. so far, Pastor Vasil, if you correct me, so far I think four Adventists have lost their lives um, from, yeah. But you're roughly, let's say four. But I know you are doing a lot to support. People have lost their homes. People have lost their livelihood. People have lost their lives. People have lost their limbs. Um, what projects are you working on? And I'm going to get Pastor Vasil to also share. Yes. Um, so, actually, this is... The most difficult part for me, I'm going to start from far, sorry. The most di difficult part was actually to get ready for this, um, mm. for this meeting. Because I spend, and every Ukrainian spends a lot of time on news. Mm. But I try to distance myself as much as possible from, from the deep. emotional element of it. Mm. Because it's so heartbreaking and it is so, uh, you know, there are no words to describe what is going on. So, so you stay I, away from watching the news because it brings... So the news, I kind of, I stay, I stay on top of there because I need to understand what is happening. But emotional part, when people write what they've, you know, what, what happened to them, that is something unspeakable. Mm. That, you know, it breaks my heart. I cannot read that. I cannot... I cannot look at it without tears. Mm. Actually, the presentation that I put in together for this melody, is actually, I, I couldn't put, I actually had hard time to place the things that would not be too graphic, if you understand mm. what I'm saying. Mm. And it's, it's just full of it. Mm. Everyone, everyone has organized themselves in terms of Ukrainians as much as they could. Everyone is doing something for their family. Everyone is helping as much as they can. The amount of destruction is unspeakable. When you look at all of the, the cities, the city that you've heard the video, I don't know if you've caught some of the conversation or not, but this is one of the major cities in Ukraine. It's almost completely wiped off from the face of the earth. Mm. And not the military objects, the, not the infrastructure, the civilian houses, everything. It's gone. And I'm not even speaking about, about that, the behavior of the, of the enemy soldiers. Anyways, um, we are praying, but apart from praying, we try to do as much as we can. We try to bring awareness to people. We try to speak to people. And everyone is, is you know, trying to help here and there and anywhere, any way to make a long story short. Um, we were blessed with the family that I have, very good and very um, heartbroken friends of mine from Canada and US. They've donated and they've raised uh, some funds which I have been transferring to Ukraine and I have been just you know getting my parents because they they've decided to remain there to bake some bread and send it to the east send it to the north send it to the occupied areas they've said that the people were crying seeing bread and saying that they haven't seen a bread in uh, mm. in 12 in in 14 uh, 20 days. days so no food whatsoever no drinking water so we've been trying to help as much as we can sending a lot of produce and by the grace of god there is there is such an amazing thing i'm going to tell you this we have been we have been sending this produce i've been receiving this money and just sending it to my uh, to my friends there so they can buy more food and send it and send it. And I've had a conversation with another group of people just recently and we've discussed it. Uh, so how much did you send? I'm like, well, I, 
I, I think around 10 tons of apples hmm. and uh, about 4,000 uh, four or 4,500 loaves of bread, about half a ton of different like rice and stuff like that. So, and he was, oh, wow, but could you be more precise? So when I actually asked my mom, because uh, she was organizing it locally, it turned out that we've sent over 30 tons of produce. Good, over man. 30 tons of produce. Amen. Amen. So when you say what are the, what are the blessings, what, what God is doing, mm. God is doing amazing things, guys. Mm. The stories that we hear of how God is protecting how God is helping, how God is providing, how he's taking the, this vehicle, this guy who was coming out of Mariupol, which is the most blocked uh, city right now. Well, right now it's gone. So um, before there, were, there was one huge plant. It's, the plant itself is the size of a city. And uh, the troops and, and civilians were hiding in the basements of, the, of this plant. Mm -hmm. And they said that army cannot free them because they are so far inside that army cannot free it but at the same time god is bringing Amen. this this guy and his four kids on a broken vehicle he has bringing them from 70 kilometers way into the the place that is controlled by by the enemy right now mm -hmm. and he brings them out Amen. isn't that a miracle Amen. with less fuel i realize they have less petrol as well and we're able to travel. Last petrol, he was saying that he only had enough from one place to another, and he didn't have anything planned. He didn't have nothing planned. When he got there, he said, I've heard the voice, and at the moment, I knew that God is just taking me. When he got some, some petrol, he drove, and, he, and the stories were like, if he would stay longer or if he wouldn't be delayed, all of them would be dead. Hmm. So God is clearly providing. There are such, a, such an amazing stories. There are horrible stories. There is unspeakable things that are happening at, at this time still. But God is, God is great. God is providing Thank so you. much for his people. Sorry for Thank taking you. No, no, so no, much if, time. Listen, Sorry. No, I this just is wanted your, to say this. This is your moment. And I, you know, it's not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just here. I want you to share what God has done through this, you know, um, um, war and through this. And I was going to ask, do you think the church has done enough? Um, Pastor, I would, I would like Pastor to join me on this question. The reason I know, do you think the Seventh-day Adventist church has done enough to support, not just the Adventist church, but have the church done enough to support um, people during this war? Uh, I just uh, share recently the message I received. There was a questionnaire uh, between the Ukrainian people, how the churches are helping. And we have Ukrainian Orthodox Church, we have Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, we have the uh, East Catholic, we, uh, we have the Cat uh, Catholic churches. And from all of them, we have one, two percentages who is helping. The people received help from them. From the Baptist Church, we had the 15%, and the Pentecostal Church, we have about 18%, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, 48% people Amen. received help. Amen. Amen. This is the most highest the our church help for the Ukrainian. Amen. That's a great blessing, and Amen. we can see how church is working at that point. It doesn't mean it's enough. We can still do more, right? Of course, we can do more, and I think after the song, we can speak a we little bit more. We can speak a little more. We're going to go to that. All right. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Hi, everyone. I'm Ivanka, and um, I asked Pastor to translate my next word because my English is very bad. Sorry. Um, I'm here two months. Because of the war. Я, напевно, ніколи не забуду ці звуки війни, як вони звучать, і буду їх пам'ятати до кінця днів. I will never forget the sound of the war. I will remember all my life what is the war. Але я вірю, що Господь зі мною, і він з тими людьми і рідними, які залишились зараз в Україні. But I believe that God is with me and with the people who are still stay in Ukraine. 
І я хочу заспівати вам одну із моїх пісень про те, що Господь він дарує мир кожному. A few years ago I wrote one song and I would like to sing this song for you that God is giving us the gift of his love. Він наш пастор, який ніколи не залишає. He is our shepherd who never leaves us alone. So we bring, we are, as we bring the program to a close, we're just going to take this last bit to ask Pastor a few questions, and then we're going to ask our brothers and sisters from Ukraine to join, and then we're going to pray with them. Um, so, Pastor, final questions coming to you now. What project? Because I, I know you go to Ukraine, and I think it's very dangerous what you do, but you do it out of faith because of the love you have for the people. You gather all, you put, bring together all these provisions, and you travel miles. You drive, you drive, yeah, right? Drive, drive. You drive from England to Ukraine yes. to deliver supplies and then come back and take more. Yeah. And there's a video of you, you know, at Trafalgar Square preaching to thousands of people, right? It was all over YouTube, Facebook. Now, I want to know if there is somebody here who wants to support what you're doing. How does the person get involved, and what project are you working on, you know? Uh, I just would like to say thanks to Adra. Adra is doing a lot in Ukraine and uh, the nearby countries like Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and they're helping as well a lot with the Adra coming in and delivering the food. But I would just say that they are doing big projects, but we are still doing some smaller projects and helping other people to survive for the children, for the refugees. 
and especially the last time when I've been, we now have one project which I would like to ask to show the pictures which we have with them. If you can just bring up the pictures before the video. Yeah, this is the Kinton Garden which our church has bought in Colomea. And uh, if you can see this part of the building, and if you can have the, another slide as well on the other side, this corner we choose to uh, refurbished and we can put the 14 people, 14 refugees to stay there because at the moment they are staying with the people at home. Uh, but they can't stay too long in the house of people and we want them to go there. Of course, if you can see the building is quite big, we would like to continue, but at the moment we, go, we would like to go step by step. If you can put the video, it's just two minutes video, thank you for your patience, to see what project is going on and what we are doing, and I'll just say a few words after that. Can we have a sound, there's English words. The building which has been bought by the church a few years ago. At this time, we try to accommodate refugees in this building and uh, we need to finish this project in this place is going to be a showers and bathroom here is going to be a toilet in this room it's going to be a kitchen and dining room as you can see quite a lot already has been done but needs finishing we have here one, a large bedroom. Here we have another large bedroom. And this is the third bedroom and the fourth bedroom. In this four bedroom, we can accommodate up to 14 people who can find a home here and can stay until they would be able to return back home. We don't know how long it's going to take, but they can stay here and enjoy their life as much as possible. I have here a local pastor who would like to say a few words. His name is Yuri Vataman. Щиро вітаю вас і щиро дякую вам за допомогу, яку надаєте нам. My greetings dear friends and I would like to thank for the help you are giving to us. Насправді у нас дуже велика потреба сьогодні. We have a big uh, need today. Ми робимо все, що можливо з нашого боку. We are doing everything possible from our side. Але цього недостатньо для того, щоб здійснити цей проект. But we don't have enough to finish this project. Просимо вашої Please help us. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you very much. God bless you in your help and in your offerings. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you as well. And you can see on the screen, this is the account details. I would like to thank the Hanslow Church, which, uh, who is now a mother church of Ukrainian church at the moment. And all donations, if you would like to help to, um, for this project, please send money to this account, but don't forget to mention support for Ukraine or Ukrainian support that we know which is coming on. Uh, thank you very much. Can I just say one more word? I would like to also ask everybody who can watching us today on the UK, if you would like to help as well for the Ukrainians, there is a program, Homes for Ukraines. Please contact Elder Andrew. Can we have another number? Uh, contact Elder Andrew on this number and say that yes, we can accommodate one, two, or family, or whatever we can do, however we can help, please contact us, and we would be really thankful, and God will bless you in all help you are giving to us. And we are praying together for these blessings and for the help. And the last song which Ukrainian friends are going to sing is about prayer. God is going to hear our prayers and in uh, the end i would like to ask you to pray for us yes thank you let's okay. listen to them and then we bring thank you
going to pray now. Um, just want to thank God uh, for allowing you all to be here. I think I met you guys about three or four weeks ago, but just for us to reunite again, I want to thank God. And I want to thank you for those of you who stayed. Um, you could have been in bed, but you decided to stay because today is Ukraine, tomorrow it might be us. And whether we like you or not, we are, whatever is happening to them, we are all feeling the effects. And we are one body. And um, the reason your brothers and sisters are seated here and people are watching at home is because we share in your pain and we share in your grief. Where we can put our pounds or our monies, we will. But there's something we can give. Because even if we don't have the gold, we don't have the silver, we have Jesus Christ. And so we're going to commit to you, your family, um, your families, and um, your, your, your extended families, and the nation of um, Ukraine. Now, for those of you who are watching, who want to support, um, you can see Pastor, Pastor, or you can see myself, you know, send the, the donations, every, anything you can. Pastor collects a lot of stuff to be sent to Ukraine. If you see him, he can work on that. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, in moments like this, we, we remind ourselves that we are only traveling through this land. And you are the only God we have. When everyone disappoints us, Lord, you never disappoint us. As we watched some of the testimonies, we saw somebody getting baptized, even in the midst of war, because he wants to give his life to you. We saw you help a family cross borders, through borders and borders, even though they were running low on fuel, Lord, you protected them. Pastor has been on his journey to Ukraine and back, there's been rockets flying on top of his car, but Lord, you brought him back. It could have been anything different, but Lord, you've protected your people. 
and you've, you've, you've protected and blessed so many. But this evening as we stand here, our prayer is that, Lord, you would reach out. Reach out to the families in Ukraine. As we are speaking now, we know there are families, families who are there crying and dying because, Lord, there's nobody to care for them. There are some of them who have run out of food. Some of them who have no hope for medicine. Some of them who have completely lost hope. I pray that, Lord, you would provide. Lord, we, when we say you provide, we know you provide. So regardless of where they are, where they, Lord, your, your word says even when we make our bed in, in hell, Lord, you are there. So regardless of where your people are, we pray you stretch forth your hand. Take them. Watch over them. Provide for them. Protect them. Let the presence of the Holy Spirit be, feel, be felt in their hearts. And bless the families here. They are also, the, you know, the direct families here, they are, they, are, they are struggling. Some mothers can't go to bed because they don't know what's happening to their families down there. But continue to hold all of them. And even as they travel, as they, they do, they tend to support, they, they support, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit to continue to lead them. And keep them. Thank you so much for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. I will pray. I will pray in Ukrainian. Добре Боже, ми щиро дякуємо тобі за те, що ти любиш нас. Незважаючи на те, що ми знаходимось в великій проблемі, в катастрофі, в війні, але ми відчуваємо підтримку нашої сім'ї в цілому світі. Ми бачимо, як ми, ми бачимо, як ти любиш нас і через наших друзів підтримуєш нас як духовно, так фінансово, так і матеріально. Господи, прости нас, якщо ми щось не навчились через те, що сталося з нашою країною. Нехай Дух ти святий дасть нам мудрість, щоб ми могли зрозуміти твою любов, могли зрозуміти, що ти хочеш навчити нас сьогодні та прийти до Тебе. Просим Тебе, щоб Ти благословив всіх, хто сьогодні має потребу в цьому, особливо тих, хто сьогодні страждають в Україні, хто знаходиться у місці війни. Просим Тебе, Господи, щоб Ти благословив всіх, хто буде пожертвувати для того, щоб Твій народ, Твої діти, щоб люди, які залишились без хати, могли мати де жити, щоб мали що їсти. Благослови кожну руку, що буде дарувати. Дякуємо за те, що ми мали цю можливість служити тобі в місці з народом твоїм сьогодні вечором. Нехай Дух Ти Святий благословить кожного із нас. За все тобі слава. Амінь. Thank you for the great opportunity to have this great program for Ukraine. Thank you, Nana, Amen. for inviting us here. Thank you so much. Here. Thank God you so much. You Thank you. Feel free. Shake hands with your brothers and sisters here. Have a good night and see you tomorrow morning at 6, right? For the morning devotion. Good God night. be with good you. Night. Thank you so much.